a musical universe knit together by dancing strings. A world where aliens live right before our eyes. A world that just might lose most of its living creatures, but where man somehow slips through. We haven't got many answers, but we've got some terrific questions. Why, if we have faster and faster and faster machines, do we feel we're running out of time? The trouble is, we're, we're addicts to time. Time! One second is cool. Two seconds is a lot. Three seconds is too long. If we are wired for speed, what are we leaving behind? We all secretly know that all those events we're shoving into those individual sets don't really give us anything in the long run. We've got some terrific questions. Plenty of questions on the road to a brave new world. What we have here is more than just a simple dilemma. This is the sort of information that can lead to panic among television anchors. I've been looking at the research, and I know that most viewers these days have the attention span of a gnat. Not all of you, of course. I certainly didn't mean you personally, but imagine the feeling of knowing that on the other side of each television screen, watching me right now, is someone holding a remote control, and... Now, that was just plain rude. I simply wanted a few seconds to explain that this program is different, even if you'll just give us the time to prove it, provocatively different, interestingly, enjoyably different. But time is the problem, isn't it? We used to have scads of time, loads of time, oodles of time, until we became so inundated by time-saving devices that the thought of losing a few seconds is more than we can abide. We are aided and abetted by so many contraptions which improve our efficiency that everyone these days expects everything to be done right away. I'd like you to meet a friend of mine. Robert Krolwich, who will be our guide tonight and over the next seven weeks. He has this knack of helping us understand what we think we already know. Does that make any sense at all? Well, let me ask you a question, Ted. In fact, let me ask everybody, why is this? 20 years ago, if I dialed the number 888-8888 on a rotary phone, sure, it took a little bit of time, but back then, this is how phones worked, and you know, it was fine. But then came the push button phone. So you go up to the push button and go beep, 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 much quicker, much faster. But now comes the interesting part. Once I had the experience of the push button, and you know, I didn't ask for push buttons, I don't need the five seconds, but once the push button phone got into my head, now, any time I happen upon a rotary phone and start to dial, now, this seems to take forever. When you think of all the other machines beyond the telephone that are pushing us and driving us to go faster and faster, whether we want to or not, you wonder... What is it about speed that is so attractive? Maybe there's something deep in our brains that says go fast, something biological. Or maybe it is cultural. Maybe it's something that we learn. But as each generation goes faster than its parents, and then faster again, how do any of us learn to slow down? Well, I decided to put these questions to Michael Malone, who hosted his own public TV show, so he knows how to walk Anytime. on cue. Perfect. When we ask him to. He's also the author of any number of books on technology, and he grew up in Silicon Valley, which has produced so many speedy gadgets. And now he's the editor of a magazine, ASAP, which is short for As Soon As Possible. He likes speed. I think we're wired for speed. So speed is better. Speed is, somehow. speed is somehow physically rewarding. It's emotionally rewarding. That's why the moment you get into a car and 
you know it's faster than the one you have, you try to see how fast that car goes. That's why you go on roller coasters. That's why uh, you kids play video games, because there's something about that rush that's absolutely enthralling. Now, is it good for you? Probably not. Uh, is it beneficial to your life? Probably not. But somehow, we're built for that. Maybe. But here is a little problem. Whenever I get a tool that makes me go faster, the next thing is I want the whole world to catch up with me. I want to make everybody go faster, and I'm not alone. This here is a perfectly ordinary phone. I have this phone here. You'll hear a ring. Okay. Because I'm simulating the actual ring. You can go with my home-built ringing phone. I ask people, okay, you tell me when you make a call, how many rings before you get irritated, and how many before you just hang up. Frankly, I figured it would be something like four gets you ticked, and six rings is when you hang up. But people got irritated very early. Now, already, <laughs> come on, answer the phone. Usually, I'm already like on the email. On the second ring. Yes. At two. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sick of this. I, I don't want to wait anymore. Until you're sick. Time is valuable, man. And unbelievably, a large number of these people right. hung up after three rings. Three. Three is a magic number. And the now? third one is like... Wow. Three rings and you're out? But why? <laughs> well, some of them said people should have their this phones guy. with them at all times. Kind of we do. <laughs> well, are, are, are the three of you just peculiar where you live, or <laughs> are you, uh, is this normal for the guy I, to I travel mean, I, with? I don't know. know anybody else who would install another phone line in the bathroom. But okay. my mom's got one. Okay, now I. Do. You're kidding. Yeah. Wait a second. Don't they know anybody, like in their family somewhere, who takes time to answer the <laughs> Is phone? There anything like, like, do you have any relatives in oh Louisiana or I've North got you, all Louisiana? Right. So I'm now. Lot slower. Lot slower. I only got one phone in the whole house. I hate visiting. <laughs> <laughs> Is it one of those rotary phones? <laughs> <laughs> all right, we're done with you guys. <laughs> all right, you proved your point, oh, yeah. says Michael uh, Malone. But quite. so what? Everybody knows speed is contagious. What's fascinating is if you see something that saved you only a second or two, say instead of dialing, all you have to say is... Ashley. Cool. Okay, now well, let's wait, 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 why, why is cool the right adjective when the game, the net game between speed dialing and get me mom, you know, between <coughs> and mom, where you don't even actually have to push with your finger onto any object, just mom. What is the savings there? Uh, an eighth of a second. It's speed for speed's sake. When you got the telephone, when you, got your, when you first got your first desktop computer, did you say to yourself, this is going to enrich my life in so many ways? You didn't do anything of that story. You said, oh, I can type on it, man. And that gave you a little rush of excitement, a little burst of adrenaline, a little thrill, like, oh, this is going to be fun. One, two. And you will find this everywhere you look, everywhere. These children are taking off their pants the old-fashioned way, sliding them down their legs. This is not fun. Now give these same children Velcro snap-off pants. Now this is fun. Or choose a very different part of life. How about orange juice? When you think about it, orange juice, too, has speeded up over the years. You may remember the very slow and methodical cut your orange and then squeeze your orange era not so long ago. Aww. But then comes frozen concentrate, so you didn't have to buy the orange or squeeze anything. You just plop it in and you pour. Even faster than that, you could then buy ready-to-pour orange juice that's pre-squeezed, no plopping, no waiting at all, except, of course, for that spout, that puzzling, weirdly folded thing on top that you had to open up somehow. Oh. So even faster was the twist open spout with a tin foil protector, which you had to peel off. Oh. Even faster than the tin foil peel is the pluck off top. Oh. And yes, fastest of all the juice box, all you do is stab and suck. And it's amazing, but we customers embrace each tiny improvement. For example, frozen concentrate sales fell 13% from 1993 to 1998. At the very same time, the faster ready-to-pour option gained 12% sales. So faster products take business from slower products. 
But who cares about saving one second switching from a peel to a pop? I don't. That's because of your metaphysics of orange juice. I mean, it doesn't necessarily... <laughs> some people, it means a whole heck of a lot. I mean, what look, look at the history of... What goes, Mom, I just saved an eighth of a second opening my orange juice. No one I know. No, saying. of course not. But an eighth of a second is a considerable increment of time at the bottom of your brain. You mean it's something way deep down in my brain is... Wants better. And can measure that kind of interval? I think so. And you know what? I decided he was right. When I found out the Sony company has a Discman option that says when you're listening to a CD, you can enjoy playing with less blank space between the tracks. Which means instead of having to endure three seconds between Frank Sinatra and the next Frank Sinatra, you can cut it way back to one second. Save two seconds per cut. I mean, really. And yet, one second is cool. Yeah, because then you don't have to, well, Two seconds is a lot. In California, I think they do that all the time. Like, like one cut to the next cut to the next cut to the next cut. A second takes a... Three seconds is too long. It's a difference. Why do they have three second pauses? Quicker is better. Yes. Yes, it's always been so, says Michael. If something was speedier... with it. You didn't think of it as, this is going to make my life faster. I'm going to do things quicker. You know, this is going to enhance every corner of my life. It's just like, neat. But now, with neat comes a little bit of a price. Like, if I were to A little bit of a price comes a huge price. Well, there you go. But is anyone aware of this? No. Yes, we are. We all know that today we have so many people who can find us, call us, beep us, write us. There's such a thing as overload, and each of us in our own way has to deal with that. And we will when we return. I want to shout it from the rooftops. This is the thinnest I've been maybe ever. I was fat. Slim Fast was the best thing that happened to me. I have lost over 50 pounds on the Slim Fast plan. I've kept it up for two years. Wow, I like that. <laughs> I take care of myself and I eat smart. I have a Slim Fast for lunch every day. That's the secret. 23 vitamins and minerals, protein, calcium, fiber, all the balanced nutrition like a healthy meal. I love it. And it really gives me a charge. Slim Fast every day. Balanced nutrition for a healthy life. I finally found the answer. Murphy, I want you to pick my wife up from the airport. Her name is Thelma. I'm Thelma. Really? Really. Camry's extra value package with CD player and six speakers and a power driver's seat. Thanks for the ride. No problem, Mrs. Burns. Who's Mrs. Burns? Did we mention anti-lock brakes? The 1999 Camry. Now with special savings. Labor of love took on a whole new meaning when Kyle was born. Twelve hours of labor. One of life's most joyful moments can also be one of its most painful. But take comfort, as so many women have in Tylenol, the pain reliever doctors and hospitals choose most. Come meet your little brother. Oh, Hello. Hello. <laughs> Tylenol, take comfort in our strength. How do you create the biggest primetime quiz show ever? Human drama, suspense, and a million bucks. Here's how you can play. Pick up a touchstone phone, call this number, quickly answer several questions, qualify for and win a playoff game. Then you could be on your way to New York City to play for a million dollars. Anyone here who doesn't want to be a millionaire? I didn't think so. Phone lines are open 24 hours a day, so call anytime. Call now. Who wants to be a millionaire? The biggest primetime quiz show ever coming August 16th to ABC. Anybody who has ever cooked breakfast for a family knows this already, but Mary Cocos knows it better. That's going to, I don't know, a stack by itself? On Saturday mornings at her diner in central Long Island in New York, every 10 minutes she's cooking about 10 different breakfasts simultaneously. Which means to keep all her customers satisfied, she has to keep in her head how long it takes to make toast, because you don't want to burn the toast, how long for cheese omelets, and how long for home fries, and how long for pancakes and crispy bacon and regular bacon. But the trick here is that all these different foods take different times to cook. They must be coordinated so they hit the plate at the right moment. 
somehow she has to keep each of those counts going simultaneously in her head. But how? That's just it. You automatically are doing things. When, once you start going, you're doing, you're not thinking that I'm cracking eggs, I'm putting bacon. You, it's just coming automatically. You're just doing it. That's right, says Professor John Gibbon of Columbia University. Brains just do this automatically. You know how at a traffic intersection when you're sitting there at a red light waiting, and without you thinking about it, somehow your ankle starts to twitch just at the moment the light turns green. Well, in the same way, that's how Mary's brain learned how long it takes to fry an egg. In these durations of time are in her head. Yes. We are in her head. Well, you point I... to it if you have <laughs> actually in the midbrain region. To show you how this is done, we are going to enter, figuratively, of course, Mary's brain, where I have asked my friends Adam and Josh, in their fashion, to demonstrate how a typical brain records how long something takes. In our brains, there are two families of cells. This one you see here is just... Pulsing! Pulsing, or ticking, 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 ticking. Is that about right? <laughs> Actually, it's, it's very close to a model that we've been working with for some time. We also have cells like this one, which is just listening, listening, listening. Well, that would be the accumulator. So, whenever we have an experience, some of our cells are ticking and some are listening. Now, the first time that Mary cooks an egg... Well, looks like we're doing eggs. Let's see. As she has this experience, the listener cells are one, counting out two, how long this takes. Four, five. When the egg is done, the listener cell concludes... Egg, five. After she's cooked a few more eggs, the memory... Egg, five. ...gets permanently recorded or fixed in her brain. Can't forget it now. So after years and years cooking all sorts of breakfasts, Mary's brain is now filled with automatic counts for everything. Eggs and bacon. Nine. French fry. Ten. Waffles. Eight. Pancakes. Eight. French toast. Seven. Yeah! Okay, now we're ready to go back and answer the question we started the program with. Why is it, when you come upon a rotary phone, why does it seem to go so slow? Well, the reason is, once we got used to the push-button phones, the listening cells in our brains decided, all right, it takes one one thousand, two one thousand, three one thousand, three beats to use a phone like this. So now when you go over and you see a rotary phone and you start to dial, now the counting cells begin to count one one thousand, two one thousand, three one thousand. You should be done. But look, the counting cell in your brain says, what's going on? This is too long. Get this over with. It's done with. Intervals too long! So you see, it's the combination of being suddenly aware that something's not right and then waiting for it to be done together. You see, that's what's so irritating. And that is why the push-button phones have in a very real way rewired our brains. New technology does change us physically. But if we're now hooked into fast, there's nothing wrong with that, says this man, Regis McKenna. Fast tools, he says, give us big advantages. So you just like this stuff. Ah, it's wonderful. I mean, I think it, it, it is, it, and, we, and by the way, we have no choice for it anyway. Regis McKenna is one of Silicon Valley's most famous pioneers, and he's what they call an early adapter. The newest computers, cell phones, beepers, you name them, he's got them. And look at this guy. He's sitting at his computer, looking at his screen, while the very same image appears on an even bigger screen, just in case, I don't know, he decides to sell tickets. I mean, why do this? Well, why not? He says, this is what Americans have always done. And this has gone on, you know, for two, three hundred years here in the United States. First we invent them, then we use them. Fast food. Pony Express, instant pudding, instant coffee, instant cameras ready to wear, self-service, they all started here. And earlier in the century during the great Oklahoma land rush, remember, the settlers who got into Oklahoma sooner got the best land. It's still called the Sooner State. And when you marry this American desire to be first with the American desire to be productive, well, perhaps the greatest display of super efficiency ever is in this scene from a 1920 Buster Keaton film, The Scarecrow, 
in which Mr. Keaton and an actor, Eddie Klein, have breakfast together, where you will see them use exactly 15 labor-saving devices which we will describe as they appear. That's number one, the salt shaker on a string. Number two is the self-opening icebox with number three, the tabletop opener. Number four, the trapeze automatic icebox return. No one, you'll notice, has to leave the table at any time during this meal. Excellent. Number five, the retractable napkin. Okay, now they're going to dump that little trolley bread basket, and number six is the removable tabletop with permanent plates and trapdoor. That's number seven, pig shoots included. The roll top desk and hose is number eight. Though the water does not appear to have any obvious destination. Number nine, multiple condiment removal. Number 10, the lamp. Number 11, the flowers. The bathtub and love seat combination is number 12. First it's a bed, then it's a hutch. That's number 13. Look at this, it's also a piano. 14. And the double face tabletop and wall hanging is. 15. And you'll notice that these guys were very comfortable with their newfangled gadgets, not unlike our friend Regis McKenna. But the world is bigger than Buster Keaton and Regis. There are a lot of folks who find new tools mystifying and scary. And as machines speed up, what is going to happen to, well, to folks like me? Look, I have, you know... Don't you know anybody? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know lots of people like you. I mean, you know... And but do you think that we are just, um, just not up to the self-discipline and to the self-education? No, I think you are actually engaged in it and, and involved in it as much as most people, uh, but it's not on a conscious level. Oh, excuse me. So we will delve into the unconscious when we return. When I had trouble getting rid of headaches with the leading pain reliever, I assumed the problem was my headaches were too tough. But you know what? The problem wasn't my headaches. It was my medicine. Because when I tried Excedrin, everything changed. My headaches went away. Completely away. Excedrin's just on a whole other level. So my headaches are still tough. But Excedrin's tougher. Excedrin, the headache medicine. Remember the last time? Uh-huh. You were supposed to bring it back, right? Uh-huh. Well, today, we're gonna try something new. A little overprotective of your Tupperware? But what if we lose the key? Get Gladware. Reusable containers you can wash, freeze, microwave, and at about 50 cents each, still afford to lose. So if they don't bring them back, don't get mad. I'm just a kid. Get Glad. Now in a new snack size. Introducing a radically new SUV, the new Nissan Xterra. Everything you need, and nothing you don't. Feminine itching, painful irritation, it's private stuff that you have to deal with. Now there's new vitamin-enriched Vagisil cream with skin-soothing vitamins E, A, and D. Vagisil stops itching fast as it soothes itchy, irritated skin with vitamins, even urine-irritated skin. And with Vagisil, the itch relief lasts hours. New vitamin-enriched Vagisil cream. Vagisil, a better understanding of better intimate care. Duval Woods, live Monday night at 8 on ABC.
It's not really all that important, but we'd like to give credit where credit is due on this program. So it was Isaac Watts, the famous 17th century hymnist, who said, For Satan finds some mischief still for idle hands to do. And while that was many years before anyone had ever heard of the fax machine or the cell phone, Robert Krolwich may have found just the sort of scene Mr. Watts had in mind. Could give me that because this is in the car. It's a strong single. This the is Sid from New York City, a very busy, very important guy with phones and beepers, two phones at the same time. Even it's though I'm Sid. not sure there's anybody on any of them. Hello. No. Now this is unbelievable. Whenever Hello. I see people who are totally wired Hello. like this, attached to their gadgets, Hello? I wonder, do they buy these things because they have to, or because it makes them Hello? look so, well, so busy? Hello? Hmm. When did important people become busy? It used to be that important people were idle. That was the whole idea. You showed your success and your wealth and your power by not doing stuff. And somewhere along the line, and I don't know when it happened, it suddenly became a measure of success uh -huh. to have no free time whatsoever. Okay, I have a call in the Harvey. Harvey's, I'll talk to Harvey about it tomorrow. And then you and I'll talk. Consuming time in the sense of every second is filled is a way of showing status now. And when you work all by yourself at home and the phone does not ring, Michael Malone remembers what that's like. There used to be days when no one would call. And here I was a freelance writer, and when no one called, I thought, oh my God, they forgot me. I've been left out of the loop. I'll never get a writing assignment again, and I'm going to have to go work at the window at McDonald's with the little paper hat on and the, and, the, and the microphone. And that was my nightmare. It is certainly possible that the impulse to buy and use these gadgets is driven in good part by fear, those secret fears that everybody has, that the great cartoonist Bill Steig captures so well. People don't want to be bored. They don't want to be alone. They don't want to be ignored. And maybe if you get enough gadgets, maybe you can keep those fears at bay. But there is one fear you can never really conquer. And so many Americans are now turning 40 and 45 and 50, the age when for the first time you think, uh-oh, one day, I'm going to die. And that sense that the clock is ticking, that whiff of mortality in the air, may explain why so many people now want to go faster and do more and pack it in, because for a huge group, which happens to include my friends John Flansburg and John Linnell and their band, They Might Be Giants, time is running out. Marching on and time. It's still marching on. This day will soon be at an end, and now it's even sooner, and now it's even sooner, and now it's even sooner. This day will soon be at an end, and now it's even sooner, and now it's sooner still. So that is why there's such recent interest in faster gadgets. It's a baby boomer thing. And all we're experiencing now is that generation's passing obsession with the idea that, oh my God, we're all gonna die. You're older than you've ever been, and now you're even older, and now you're even older, and now you're even older. You're older than you've 
ever been and now you're even older and now you're older still okay i put it to michael malone this obsession with minutes and seconds and efficiency it's all going to disappear right when you and all the other baby boomers disappear i don't believe it i disagree i think we all secretly know that all those events we're shoving into those individual seconds don't really give us anything in the long run. I think we have this idea in the back of our minds, and maybe this is why we try to do so much so fast and try to speed things up, is that we're buying time. If I, if I become infinitely efficient, increase my efficiency, speed up my productivity, I can, at some point in my life, stop and step out of time that so makes it's not my then life saving worthwhile. Time so I'm with, before I die, it's saving time so that I can live. That's right. The opposite. We're trying to save time so we can live. The trouble is, we're, we're addicts to time. And the hardest thing in the world is to stop. After all, look what lots of us do with our free time. Hours and hours every day we sit, apparently quite relaxed, but look at our fingers. Our fingers have found a gadget that tells the truth about us. Yes, it's easier to move the joint in your thumb one sixteenth of an inch rather than cross a six and a half foot space, which means getting up and then itching and changing the channel. The TV remote reveals something profound about people. Used to be guys did it more than gals, but now when you get down to the youngest group, girls and boys click at about the same rate. Do you want to see Snow White? Oh, I'm going to see that. This drives programmers crazy, even the most popular shows on television. Take this one, for example. Most people who tune in for this show, and mind you, this is a drama. To make sense of it, you got to stick with it for a while. And yet, 55% of this show's audience watches less than half. They love it, but they leave it. Now, that's the most popular show on TV. In a more ordinary drama, typically, three-fourths of the audience disappears without seeing most of the show. Three-fourths go away, and that's normal. And here's a show I was once on. The TV ratings showed that when this image of a tuba player by a pool of alligators came on TV, more than a million households clicking by said, hmm, what is this? And they stopped. A million extra households. You know how many Astrodome's worth of people that is? But then just as quick as I got them, about two minutes later, I lost them. Bye-bye. That is the sound of more than one million households leaving me. So many viewers are now in motion, the advertisers cut their messages much faster, hoping this will keep you watching. But the faster they cut, the quicker we click. So the ads have to get even quicker until we found a chief executive who decided, how about a one-second ad? I don't know that you can say everything you want to say in one second. Neither do we, but here it is. Thank you. It's amazing how long one second really is. Uh, when you see it on TV. Isn't that true? Or at least he hopes it's true. Come on, just leave it on. We who make TV know that you who watch TV, many of you have the attention span of a three-year-old. But that's what happens when hundreds of millions of people get a gadget that allows them to indulge their every whim instantly. Are you suggesting to me that we may be suffering from an infantilization of our culture? Exactly. Oh, I, I, what, what a new concept. <laughs> I hadn't, that hadn't crossed my mind. Well, of course we are. Well, what are you saying? You're saying then that gadgets come into our lives, ineluctably speed us up, ineluctably tap into our six-year-old, gotta-have-it, greedy part, and that the world then becomes it, it taps a into our six... six it, our six-year-old is the higher part of the brain. It also taps into the medulla, our reptile brain, which says... Yeah, so you create... Something goes then, by, eat it. Yeah, something goes by. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, so then you end up then with a with six billion creatures on the world saying, "Give me, give me, give me now." What kind of a world is that? I think it's the world we currently live in. If you look around you, is the trend towards infantilization? Yes. Is the trend towards immediate gratification? Yes. Is the challenge for every adult to try to carve out what matters and to delay gratification and to fight for these more enriching things? Absolutely. Does it get harder every year? Absolutely. Do I have a solution? No. But oh, maybe there is a solution and you're looking at it. We'll be right back. And here we are. Hello.
Nightline in Primetime, Brave New World, continues after this from our ABC stations. It's about vision. It's about that part of imagination which lives outside the lines. It's about focus and the engineering freedom to change everything that was or question everything that is. It's insight and the flow of original thinking that can revitalize an industry or rewrite its rules. It's foresight and the discerning intelligence to negotiate surprise and navigate new ground. It's thousands of people visualizing change and one company's way of looking at tomorrow. Whatever your style or taste, Martha Stewart Living will make your day more interesting, exciting, and fulfilling every day. I'm Brad Douglas. Here's what we're working on for 7 Eyewitness News at 10. Much of the nation continues to suffer from extreme temperatures. So is this heat wave a part of a new weather trend? We'll tell you at 10. Plus, there are many wives' tales on how to choose the sex of your child. In tonight's Look at Your Health, we'll have the latest success in sex selection. And in sports, Eric continues his preview of the upcoming SEC football season. And meteorologist Eddie Holmes has a look at it will hit the century mark again tomorrow. He'll have full details coming up in your exclusive AccuWeather forecast. Join us for more 7 Eyewitness News. Eyewitness News tonight at 10. There are people in America who think very carefully about new machines about how machines can speed us up, about how they change our lives. This is Amish country near Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Hmm. Professor Diane Umble grew up here. So this is it. This is it. What do you call it? An Amish community telephone or a phone shanty. Sometimes they call them phone shanties. But it's quite far from this farm and quite far from that farm. Quite far from the house, yeah. on purpose. This is an Amish community telephone shack. Years ago, folks around here decided it's okay to use telephones, but they also decided not to make it easy. Go ahead, in, and the cameraman will follow you. It doesn't have any seats. It's, right. it's... To uh, purposely make it a little uncomfortable? So you can't sit here and talk, chat forever and ever for the whole evening. It's not that the Amish are anti-telephone, that's not it. It's just that they want important routines in their lives. Their meals, their prayer meetings, their family get-togethers. These things, their leaders say, should not be casually interrupted. They're suspicious. They have a healthy suspicion of things that speed things up and that are too easy. Huh. They value hard work and they have made choices not to get caught up in pace, the fast pace of things. If you choose to use a horse and buggy to get around, that means you have time to think, you have time to reflect, you have time to enjoy the beauty around you. And how do we account for the suspicious success of cell phones? <laughs> well, now, that, that is one of those things that I think flies in the face of of the value system. I did talk with a saleswoman from a local cell phone store, and I don't want to embarrass anybody here, but she says last year she sold two cell phones every month to Amish families, then three a month, now four a month. And families use these phones, she says, to call suppliers or customers. It's business calls, not social calls. Still, if one of these folks does have a cell phone in their pocket, you could imagine a situation where they might be tempted. So they are constantly making choices. So bit by bit, in marches speed. In marches slowly, incrementally. 
And far from Pennsylvania, back in Silicon Valley, technology champion Regis McKenna says he's convinced that in 30 years, even the Amish will be on the phone and online. I think that they're adopting the cellular phone because it is a network. It, it connects them. It connects them with the outside world, particularly the young people. It'll, it'll really have a tremendous impact upon them, I think, 10, 20 years from now. You can slow them down, says Regis, but nobody can beat these new technologies. In the end, we will all go faster. I think that you will find that these technologies change you, even though you try uh, consciously to impose your uh, value systems on it. It has more impact on changing you than you do on it. Imagine man-made moons helping us to communicate. And why will machines speed us up? What makes them so irresistible? Well, Regis has a view of human beings that not everybody has, but it's his view. Hey, we live in a real world. This is how you are. You are a good person by what you do. And the more you do, the better person you are, says Regis. We are social animals. That's why we can't resist these tools. They help us be social. They help us connect. But isn't Regis forgetting something? You've got two parts to yourself. You've got an outer life and an inner world. And what we're forgetting in this culture is the inner world. Jacob Needleman teaches philosophy at San Francisco State, and he says humans do not exist to be busy all the time. And of course, it's true. There are times making love, making art, or just lost in thought. The time seems to vanish. And it's these times when we're not doing, but just being. That's when the latest, fastest machines don't matter so much. In fact, that's how you escape machines when you want to. The problem is Regis McKenna doesn't want to, ever. If I took you, Regis McKenna, and stuck you in a sensory, in a closet, nothing even as exciting as a sensory deprivation device, I stick you in a closet and I say, Regis, you're in there for the next two hours. Is there any possibility that... No, I'd, I'd be pretty antsy. I'd, I'd be... Uh, I like to do things all the time. Well, you could I, do I, things, I, like you could dream. You could recite old poems. Well, you can, except that, that you know, I'm, I'm one of those people that believes that you actually live by being engaged in the world. So well, though, there's you, a world in your head. You're not... You're disengaging you know, from the physical world and joining the world in between your ears. Yeah, that in, in some extent, that's true, but I can't think change and, and make the world change. <laughs> so you live there in that closet for the two hours, and you think, well, that was a two hours wasted completely. Yes, I would think that was a wasted two hours. I think this, this fellow, I, I, maybe I should, he should learn, he could learn that sitting in the closet for an hour or two can be a very rich thing and, and nourish your outer life, too. In my mind, this is a rejection of the world. It's a rejection of who we are. It's a temporary vacation from the physical universe, which you apparently are never going to take. <laughs> Have you noticed it's what you value in life that determines how susceptible you are to these fast machines? If you like doing and connecting like Regis, well then, faster tools are going to be pretty hard to resist. If, however, you value solitude and contemplation, then the very same tools lose their grip. The question is, what do you value? And we will address that question musically when we come back. The ball is in your court. Everything is turning around. It's time for the 99 Honda clearance. Now it's your turn to call the shots. The 99 Honda Clearance. Don't you just love it when you win? I'm concerned about my cholesterol. Got a bite. Cutting back on junk food. Fortunately, my wife Joy discovered a new spread called Take Control. Take Control helps promote my healthy cholesterol levels. And it's delicious. New Take Control. Come on, let's go. Camcorder, $400. Three-hour tape, seven dollars. Extra battery, twenty-five dollars. Home movies with Hank Aaron and Willie Mays, 
priceless. Use your MasterCard and you could win four tickets to a 99 World Series game and sit with baseball's legends. There are some things money can't buy. For everything else, there's MasterCard, sponsor of the Major League Baseball All Century team. Three things I always do before I barbecue ribs. Whip up my secret hot sauce, get the coals just right, and I always take a Pepsi AC. Whatever's cooking, Pepsi AC can stop heartburn before it starts. Oh, yeah. After three Emmy Awards for The Practice and 26 more nominations this year for Ally McBeal on The Practice, what will David Kelly do next? Bring you a team of private eyes who break the rules and bend the laws, all in the name of justice. The work is dangerous. Hold on to your skirts. I'm getting parsed. Lunchtime! The suspects are outrageous. You will not believe this. Just watch. <laughs> And the toys are fabulous. Shot him with a tranquilizer. Give me the gun. Give me the darts, too. Gina Gershon. Want a hug? I was just kidding. Paula Marshall. I'm on the plank here. You are thinking with your plank, and I don't want to go down that plank again. From the creator of The Practice and Ally McBeal comes the private eyes that'll get you. Bugs your house. We do that sort of thing. David Kelly snoops ABC Sundays this fall. Chevrolet cars are trusted by more Americans than any other. Chevy trucks are the most dependable, longest lasting on the road. If that's not enough reason to own a Chevrolet car or truck, then this definitely is. The great summer drive-in from Chevrolet. You can get behind the wheel of a 99 Chevy Cavalier and get $1,500 cash back or low 0.9% APR financing. Or check out the offers on other great Chevrolet cars and trucks. It's Chevrolet's great summer drive-in. See your local Chevrolet dealer today. In an attempt now to tie this broadcast together, let us admit the following. First, David Pleasant, who helped us score the show, will be happy to demonstrate this. There is something exciting about speed. <laughs> but nobody wants this pace all the time. It's too much. So what Regis McKenna proposes is embrace speed, live your life as fast as you want, but remember you can create pauses and breaks. You program your computer and your beepers and your cell phone to vary the mood to suit you. The philosophy professor, Jerry Needleman, has a very different idea. On the outside, he says, you can be busy with your schedule and your machines, but inside, he says, try to find the quiet spot where you can go and commune. Escape, he says, to the inside. <laughs> Michael Malone. Silicon Valley offers us a third approach. We have appetites, of course, and desires, he says, but the trick with technology, as with all things, is be an adult. Control your appetite. You don't have to buy this and see that. To be truly rich, limit what you want. Less, he says, is more. By any of these routes, really, it is possible, I think, to slow down, get control. But Ted, you know, when I started this program, I thought it was going to be about machines. It turns out it's really about people and their values. If you have one kind of set of values, this is not going to be a problem. For you. I'd, I'd love to believe that you're right, but I don't. I think it's about machines. I think there is a tyranny of technology which determines the pace of our lives. And 150 years ago, when we lived in an agrarian society, people got up when the sun rose, they went to bed when the sun went down, they did or did not go to Philadelphia for a weekend because it was a hundred miles away and there was just no way to do it in the time available. But that doesn't mean just if you have a telephone in your house, you don't have to answer it. You don't have to answer it by the second or third ring. There are ways to massage this. 
There are certainly ways to massage it. I, I buy that much. But I think there are expectations that people have. Because the phone exists, people expect you to answer it. Because email calls for an instantaneous response, people are not satisfied waiting a day or two. The technology, I believe, makes a difference. And you think there's no, no place to hide? I, I think that's the best possible way you could put it. Right, David? No hiding place! No hiding place! No hiding place! And now that we are confident, at least of your attention, when we come back, we'll look at what we'll be doing over the next several weeks on A Brave New World.